Thomas Kuhn was a postgraduate student in theoretical physics at Harvard. He was almost ready to finalise his dissertation when he became intrigued with the history of science. By examining what had happened in many different scientific disciplines, he concluded that science does not work the way he'd been taught. He left his studies in theoretical physics and devoted his life to the history and philosophy of science. His most influential work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, started as an essay in the International Encyclopedia of United Science. It was expanded to a book, which sold more than a million copies. It's considered one of the most important books in the history of modern science. Kuhn points out that every branch of science becomes locked into a theoretical framework, which he calls a paradigm. Education and training in a scientific discipline is so focused on the paradigm that by the time scientists can become professionals in the field, their education has been so rigorous and rigid that it comes to exert a deep hold on the scientific mind. Such a strong hold that their research becomes a strenuous and devoted attempt to force nature into the conceptual boxes supplied by professional education. This is true of every branch of science, physics, biology, astronomy, chemistry, cosmology, whatever. And this situation, which Kuhn calls normal science, carries on even when experimental results disagree with the paradigm. Initially, such anomalous results are just ignored. There must have been an error in the measurements. Then, as these results are confirmed by other experimenters, ad hoc additions to the theories are brought in. As more and more results contradict the paradigm and more and more ad hocs have to be brought in to explain them, some scientists start to question the paradigm. At first, they're criticised, resisted and defunded. But as evidence becomes overwhelming, a school of dissidents gradually arises, and a search begins for a new paradigm to replace the old. Any theory with the status of a paradigm can be declared invalid only if an acceptable alternative is available to take its place. This is widely known as the best-in-the-field theory and it guarantees that ideas known to be false may not be declared to be false unless the establishment governing the paradigm has accepted an alternative. This occurred with the theory of evolution. When scientists of the stature of Goldschmidt started admitting that neo-Darwinism was utterly useless and inadequate to explain the facts, he pointed out that Hopeful monster theory fitted the data far better. There was no chance that could ever be accepted by the establishment. But when Stephen Jay Gould put forward punctuated equilibrium, it gained a wide following, and many, including Gould, thought it was going to be accepted as the best in the field. They started to openly admit the untenability of Darwinism. But when punk eek collapsed, they all had to go back to accepting Darwinism, in spite of knowing it was false. We see the same thing happening now with the Big Bang. The ad hocs, which keep having to be brought in to explain anomalies, were already embarrassing even before the James Webb telescope caused panic and sleepless nights for the Big Bang experts. That's why we have to abandon the Big Bang. I think everyone is keen to abandon a theory if there is a better alternative. 
In episodes 74 and 75, we saw that many replacements are being put forward. Space but no time. The big bounce. Five-dimensional black holes. String gases and many more. It's only a matter of time before the Big Bang collapses and something, perhaps on the lines of Lerner's plasma model, is reluctantly accepted to replace it. I find it intriguing that Kuhn was close to writing his dissertation in theoretical physics when he began to realise these things. He didn't finish his thesis. He immediately dropped it and turned to the philosophy and history of science. Could it be that the scales fell from his eyes and he realised that the paradigm guiding his research was close to collapse? I think it would be interesting to find out. But what I find very alarming is that some Christian scientists and even creationists appear to be as firmly imprisoned in the crumbling paradigm of Einstein's relativity as the atheists. A group of scientists who I hold in very high esteem for their stand for the gospel made a video about the James Webb telescope. In episode 59, we looked at early results from James Webb. Since then, many more observations have been made. They're in even more serious conflict with the Big Bang. To any reasonable person, they show that the theory is utterly disproved. The team of Christian scientists looking at these latest results were Danny Faulkner, Rob Webb, Jason Lyle and Stuart Burgess. They made loud claims that they do not support the Big Bang and believe the Bible. And I think it's important to point out that the fact that we believe in dark matter, that doesn't depend on the Big Bang no. idea. But they support the vast distances that come from the Big Bang, despite the fact that Jeremiah 31, 37 guarantees that nobody will ever be able to measure the heavens above, just as nobody will ever be able to search out the foundations of the earth beneath. They also support the expanding universe, which is specifically part of the Big Bang Theory, whether they admit it or not. If you look back, uh, he mentioned the distance being 33 billion light years. That's a we can talk about that if we need to, but the uh, the distance the light's been traveling, I think, is going to be on the order of like 13, uh, 13 and a half billion uh, light years distance, different ways we can talk about it within general relativity. And they certainly do support Einstein's relativity. Um, that would correspond to about 460 billion light years if you're using light tra if you're using um, uh, luminosity distance and, and so on. There's different distances in relativity, but baked into all those is the assumption that this this metric is describing the universe correctly. And I'm now thinking that that might not be right. It's not really consistent with the data that we're seeing. It's nice that they attribute creation to God, but that seems completely out of place. Einstein's general relativity seems to rule their thinking. That's a little bit of an assumption too. Yes, there is a distance redshift relation, but baked into that are certain assumptions about how the universe is expanding. There's the assumption that there's the that the Robertson-Walker metric is correctly describing the expansion of space, and I never really questioned that until because it's not a, it's not it's something that that the big bang needs, but it's not something that's inherently big bang. It's just one of the ways of describing the curvature of space-time. General relativity is based on the creation of an atheist mathematical worldview. Remember episodes 55 and 56, when mathematicians were working to make mathematics creator-free. Cantor scornfully said, Kronika needs God, I do not. So, he made the basis of his mathematics the concept of infinity, a mathematical concept with no reality in the created world. Hilbert gloated, nobody shall drive us from the paradise which Cantor created for us. 
So, not surprisingly, Minkowski made up his own creator-free mathematics with the dimension of imaginary time multiplied by the speed of light, which also has no reality in the created world. Einstein built relativity on that anti-creator foundation. We saw in episodes 72 and 73 that scientists of the highest level have called relativity a collection of sometimes contradictory assumptions. Philosophy, not physics. An obvious absurdity. Just nonsense. And a magnificent mathematical garb which makes people blind to the underlying errors. How can we wonder at atheists being imprisoned by the paradigm when even well-meaning Christians, even creationists, are in the same bondage? And then dark energy, I'm, I'm with you, Danny. I'm a little bit more skeptical of that. I'm open to it because general relativity does allow for it. But at the same time, uh, it might be just because we've been misinterpreting. We've been using the wrong metric, perhaps, yeah. to describe uh, what we're seeing in terms of the, the expansion of the universe um, I reject the notion that we're looking, we're effectively looking back in time. That's a nuanced issue because uh, general relativity tells us that space and time are a little different than most people assume. And there's more than one way to, to synchronize clocks and to measure speeds and so on. It's amazing that they can read Genesis chapter 1 and still believe in the Big Bang universe, even though they claim they do not believe the Big Bang itself. In chapter 1, verse 2, we see the Spirit of God moving over the waters on the first day. On the second day, we see him creating the firmament of the heaven in the middle of the waters to divide the waters into two parts. After creating the firmament of the heavens, he stretched them out. On the third day, he transformed the waters under the firmament of the heavens into the earth. On the fourth day, he created the heavenly bodies and placed them in the firmament of the heavens, between the earth and the waters above. So we have the earth, made from the waters below the firmament, in the centre of the creation, and the firmament of the heavens surrounding the earth and populated with stars, and the waters above forming the outer boundary of the creation. The fact that the waters above are still there, forming the outer boundary, is confirmed by Psalm 148, verse 4. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. It's also confirmed by the fact that no matter which direction one points a microwave detector, there's a constant signal of about minus 270 degrees indicating that the waters above are very cold. The only reason I can see for any Christian not being able to see this structure is that they're imprisoned in the paradigm of Einstein, not Moses, of whom Jesus said, Had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.